Welcome to the Catholic Voices podcast. I'm your host, Brendan Alejandro Thompson, and it is my pleasure to be in St. Patrick's Soho Catholic Church in London with Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, it's great to be with you. Brendan, good to be with you. And we're here for, because you're on a tour of London, on a mission of London for the week. So we'll talk a little bit about that, but my, uh, I've been really excited to talk to you about your approach to public speaking and preaching. Mm. One of the best introductions I ever heard of a speaker was um, that the speaker came on stage and, and they said, I want to thank God for all of the hours of prayer that this person has spent, all of the quiet study, all of the conversations that they've had that have led them to this moment. So as you know, kind of like, if you look at an iceberg, everything below the waterline. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was conscious as I looked through all your content, I don't think you've ever spoken say, publicly mm -hmm. about that kind of, you know, under the hood of, of Bishop Barron's approach. And yeah, you know, it calls to mind uh, Fulton Sheen. And of course, we're at this place that Fulton Sheen meant where he ministered mm -hmm. when he was in England. Um, but Sheen was asked one time toward the end of his life, you know, he gave a sermon and someone said, Archbishop, how long did you work on that sermon? And he said, 45 years, you know. So it's that same idea. <laughs> Your whole formation in a way goes into it and you're relying on everything you've read and heard and, and done before. And so it, there is that, yeah, under the surface quality of the, the iceberg. Um, but it's a, it's a subtle, complicated process, I would say, if you really dig into it, you know, how you get ready for even... A short presentation, you know, the one I gave this morning was about know, 20, 25 minutes, but um, there's, a, there's a bit of process behind that. Yeah. There was, um, it's been attributed to various American presidents, so I'll just say anonymous, but they were, they were asked to give a speech and they said, how long is the speech? He said, because if it's half an hour, give me a week, uh, you know, a couple of weeks to yeah. prepare. If it's 10 minutes, you know, give me a month or two to prepare. Yeah. If there's no time limit, I'll begin now. That's right. <laughs> so I think it leans into that sense of the distinction, I guess, is between proxima and remote preparation. So mm -hmm. remote preparation, the cultivation of virtues, the learning of, you know, attitudes, skills and knowledge that helps one to be a speaker. Yeah. And then they say the proxima, I've got this talk with this particular deadline. So maybe we just um, scale back to the kind of remote preparation. So, you know, you've done theological studies, studies yeah. for the priesthood, your seminary rector, bishop. What's that kind of remote, what are, what are some attitudes or um, principles that could help somebody who's trying to be a, 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 you know, in public speaking or preaching? I remember years ago, a teacher of mine at the seminary said, preachers are like sharks, you know, you're going through the water and all you're doing is looking for food all the time. <laughs> so you're, and that's true though, you're always aware Oh, yeah, I could use that. Oh, yeah, that's good. That story, that insight, that perspective, uh, that idea, that book I just read, that would be good for. And usually you know which talks are coming up. And so you're in your reading. And, and one thing I would say, read, 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 and read. If you're going to be a public speaker, you're trading in words. And to, to be immersed in the world of words and to be at home with words and to use them as tools and, and to love them, have a refined sense of words. That's really key, I think. But you're like a shark. You're, you're always on the lookout, you know, for a good image, a good idea, a good turn of phrase. Remember in, um, what was the movie? Shakespeare in Love, remember? And they show Shakespeare going through the town and he hears one guy yelling at the other, you know, a plague on both your houses. And he goes, kind of made a <laughs> mental note of that. And there's something of it, I think, in, in public speakers. So do you have like a, a, a notebook? Do you keep them kind of analog, like a written notebook, no, or digital? I don't do that, but I, I would make mental notes, yeah. And and I would relate things to talks I know that are coming up. So like for this uh, tour, you know, of, of London, I knew the various places I'd be speaking. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So last night I spoke at, at Parliament, and I began with the story about Gandhi, right? The young Gandhi coming to London. Well, at the time, this is many months ago, I was reading Gandhi's autobiography for another project. And I'm reading along, and he tells this marvelous story about when he's a young kid, shy, afraid, coming to London, and then finding the Bible and finding the Sermon on the Mount. And I, I think, hey, hey, that would be really good for my talk in Parliament. So I went, I remember to my computer, I was in LA at the time, and I did write that up as a little vignette. and thought, okay, I'll use that for that talk. 
And there's a, there's a good organizing principle, like Cicero talks about his uh, kind of five canons of, of speaking or communication. So you've got invention, which is, you know, kind of bringing that process basically of the shark of finding the yeah. different arguments that would come to and distilling and that processing. So, and then arrangements so of bringing it into a kind of, you know, logical coherent structure that makes yes. sense, and style, memory and delivery. Mm -hmm. And it's always struck me that particularly, I, I'm, and nothing against priests and preaching, but there's so much of, I guess, theological formation that means you do a lot on, let's say, invention, so the crafting of an argument and arrangement. So you can have many wonderful university sermons. Yeah, right. But that style, memory, and delivery, what does that yeah. look like for you? Well, and I, I rely a lot on Aristotle's, you know, back in his rhetoric from the ancient world. Uh, every good speech, a persuasive speech has to have logos. There has to be logic, arrangement, and arguments being made. And I, I like the word argument. It's not a popular word, but it's a good word that every, every persuasive speech, and a homily is certainly that, should have an argumentative form. I don't mean contentious. I mean, it, it's laying out a demonstration of some kind. So it has to have a logical structure. But the second thing Aristotle said is pathos. There has to be feeling. It has to be pathetic in that literal sense that the feeling and the passion of the speaker comes through. Fulton Sheen put it this way, that, that people only really listen to an excited speaker. And that's true, isn't it? If, if you're not excited about what you're saying, why should the people get excited about it? That's why Sheen said, you know, you should never read from a text. Because the answer would be, well, look, if, if you can't memorize the darn thing, how do you expect me to remember it? You know, So logos, a pathos. And the final thing for Aristotle was ethos. The character of the speaker has to come through, and he thought that was the most important thing. Uh, if you're saying one thing and you're living in a totally different way, and people know that or they can sense that, you will not be persuasive. So those three things. Um, you mentioned memory. Very interesting to me. Um, like the talk at Parliament. I'll give you an example. So I would have put those notes together. I, I, I don't write it out word for word. I have kind of like talking points, elaborated bullet points. Um, I would have written that last spring, probably. And then we were supposed to be here in September. It was called off. So I kept it in my computer. Well, I took it out maybe a week ago, right? And, oh, there was the talk at Parliament. Oh, okay, you're right. I got Gandhi. I remember, and then I did this. Well, then in the course of the flight over here, the course of the, that first full day, I basically memorized the talking points. So I had about six pages, maybe, of elaborated talking points. I like to reach the point in a talk like that if someone just took my notes away or that, hey, you know, we lost your notes, it wouldn't bother me. And I, I don't think I looked at them very often last night because I, I basically had them memorized. So that's what I do with, with let's say, a 45 or 50 minute presentation. Um, and I do use some of the old, those old medieval um, memory techniques. You know, they talk about the house of memory. Yeah. Uh, you imagine a house with its different rooms. And the first part of your talk with the Gandhi, oh yeah, come in, the Gandhi, he's in, he's in that you know, front room. And then I go from that room into the kitchen. Oh, and that's where that next part of the paper is. And I go from the kitchen into the, into the dining room. Oh, and that's where that third part is. And I go upstairs in that first front bedroom. That's the fourth part of my talk. So that's the house of memory. And you put the different parts of your talk in the different rooms. That's extraordinarily helpful. And that's an ancient technique. Um, the Greek technique, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we've kind of lost that, I think. Maybe the computers have not helped us there. We think everything is, you know, uh, can be stored in a computer, but but learning how to store it in your brain. And that's just a super useful way to do it. So that sometimes there's a, a, maybe an immature uh, way of thinking about it, that somehow the scriptures mean that you've got to do everything off of the cuff. Or, and of course, there are moments, I think, when you're called to do something extemporaneously, the Holy Spirit might, you know, yeah. guide you to kind of set aside. But... Have you ever been challenged on that, that sense of kind of memorizing things? Challenged meaning that you shouldn't do it that You shouldn't point? do it, yeah. No, I, I, the trick is, and I learned this from Sheen, really. Uh, Sheen would speak in his, in his television performances for about 30 minutes without a note in front of him, not reading anything, but speaking very articulately. Um, how'd you do that? And Sheen would say, well, the hours of preparation and what he used to do, he was a great linguist, he would speak the talk out loud in French and then in Italian to make sure he had it in his mind, the ideas. And then he would speak it through in English and then he was ready to go on the air. Uh, I do that. So if I have, uh, if I have um, the outline, basically, I don't do it in the different languages, but 
I'll talk it out loud, like in a car or in my room, if, if people won't think I'm out of my mind. But I, I will speak it out loud and walk around the room and then try something or, well, oh, that word didn't work or no, that, that connection wasn't properly mm -hmm. made. And that's how I refine it. I did some of that in, in London here, walking along the um, uh, rock over the Thames. And I, I was speaking some of that, that uh, parliament talk out loud. So that's how I work it. And I think he also said that if you just continue to think about, think about the ideas, you know, you're kind of processing all of the stimulus that you're receiving, that eventually all you're doing is saying what you think. So yeah. you don't need to, you know, when somebody asks me what my name is or where my address, I don't right. even think about it. I don't have it memorized in a sense. It's integrated. Right. It takes an enormous amount of preparation. That's true to reach that point where you have that freedom from the text and you've so internalized it. But you have to have the logos in place. A lot of people in my generation, you know, were taught, hey, you know, get rid of that text and, you know, just speak from the heart. And the problem with that was logos took a vacation. So it was a lot of pathos and a lot of free association. And let me tell you about my vacation. And But it, it didn't have a logical structure, argumentative form. And, and see, that isn't compelling to an audience because if you can't follow what's being said and A doesn't follow from B and from C, you lose interest. That's when you drift off, you know. So you have to have the law of us. But if you're missing pathos, same problem. Someone's droning his way through a speech and doesn't seem at all interested in his own speech. Audience won't get interested. You know, so it's that combination of the two things. But it takes a lot of time and effort to internalize um, rhetoric to that degree. And I guess one of the other challenges a speaker has is that if you think of like a, the, the Venn diagram of those three, you know, yeah. modes of persuasion, so the logos, the ethos, and the pathos, yeah. different talks will sit differently. Yeah. There's a kind of constellation. So if you're giving a legal speech, yeah. then of course you want it to major on logos and less yeah. on pathos. Yeah. You know, exactly. if you're an angry mob, it's pure pathos. Right. So in terms of modulating, so I've, you know, I've kind of noticed the, the difference between the talk at parliament yesterday, say, and yeah. the talk to kind of an in-house Catholic audience yeah. today. So how do you do some of that kind of modulation as you move between those modes? I think the single hardest thing in public speaking is, is fitting your speech to the audience. That's the hardest thing. What is my audience? What are they open to? What are they capable of? Uh, what level should I go at? I find that's the hardest thing. I remember one time years ago, there was a conference at Mundelein Seminary, very high level. It was the Bible and something, and it was very high level academic. So I prepared this very serious paper, 20 page academic paper, and I read it because that's what we have to do. And afterwards, this lady came up to me and she said, she had listened to my sermons and all this. And she said, what was that? And I said, well, it was, it was a paper. She goes, I brought high school kids down from Wisconsin. They didn't know what you were talking about. I said, well, ma'am, it was an academic. Well, yeah, but it, it was a complete waste of our time. I'm sorry. <laughs> but so it, it, that was an example of the speech not fitting, at least that part of my audience. That's maybe the hardest thing is to get that right. You know, if, if the rest of your life, all you have to do is write academic papers and deliver them. In a way, that's really easy. When I went to Oxford a couple years ago after the Newman canonization, I had this serious paper, 20 pages, epistemology, all this stuff. That's easy. Get to a podium, got text in front of me, you just read it, you know, with a little bit of, I think, of energy. But that's easy. Last time was much harder. When you have an audience in front of you and you want to engage them, you have something substantive and logical to say, but you don't want to just read, you know, words. That's more challenging. That's more of a performance then, you know. Uh, sometimes it's appropriate to read a paper. That's, sometimes that's the right thing to do. Um, I guess, easy. And good good public speaking often requires you to repeat yourself quite a lot because otherwise yeah. it's the, the pressure of kind of constantly having new things to, to say. So I, I guess I notice, you know, if you're giving a speech, sometimes there's, you know, the kind of barren highlights. Like, oh, there's yeah. you know, Baron's best bits in a sense. No, so I, do you find like it exhausting to have to do it again and again, finding that passion? And No, if the audience is different, I, I don't. And, I, and to that point, I do think it's very important in uh, teaching and public speaking that you have, not that you're, I hope, you know, tediously giving the same talk all the time, but that there's certain points of reference that, that come through a lot. And then people are like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got it. Oh yeah, that's, that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's an old principle too, is, is repetitio mater studiorum. You know, repetition is the mother of studies. And so when you hear something repeatedly, that's helpful to people. So just before we go to a um, go to a break, have you got a, a Pope Francis recently gave advice? You know, he's given variously yeah. advice to priests on preaching. Yeah. What would be uh, Bishop Barron's advice to priests on preaching? 
Well, I, I would logos, pathos, ethos is not bad. I mean, stay with Aristotle's uh, recommendations from the rhetoric. Um, but you know, I think the needful thing at the moment is probably more logos. I think to keep, make sure that the speech you're giving has a beginning, a middle, and end, has an argumentative form. I mean, it's it's making a point in a coherent way, and that you could. This was said to me years ago, and it's, it's helpful, that you could put the theme of your sermon on one of those little signs outside the church. If you're going by a church and there's a sign with a little like motto on it, you know, if you can't do that, you haven't distilled it enough. You haven't thought it through sufficiently. So can you put the theme of your sermon on one of those little signs in like a handful of words? I'd say that. Thank you. So... We're just going to take a break. And after the break, we're going to explore a little bit more about Bishop Barron's tour to London and the, the kind of big theme of the life of St. Thomas More. Thank you very much. God bless. So welcome back to the Catholic Voices podcast with my guest, Bishop Robert Barron. So we're going to just move now to talking about our week here in London. Yeah, so good. we've been preparing for it for Long longer time. than expected. <laughs> yeah. So we were meant to have it in September gone. Mm -hmm. And you were you were there in Rome on mm -hmm. the Thursday. Yeah. And then later that evening, the Queen died. The Queen died, yeah. I remember yeah. talking to... Um, to your brother John on the phone. I think you were in a restaurant in, in Rome. And we were in a restaurant with you know, my brother and Father Paul Murray. I don't know if, if your listeners know him, but a you know, great spiritual teacher at the Angelicum in Rome, an old friend. And we were out for dinner. And before dinner, he said, uh, I said, you know, the, the queen evidently is quite ill. And he said, oh, I, I would, I'm sure she'll be, you know, she'll survive for many more. And then in the course of that dinner, we got the word that she had died. And so we made, it was a difficult, but it was the right decision not to come because, you know, that week was very chaotic here. And so anyway, rescheduled for now and here we are. Yeah. And it's been a fantastic start. So at, at this point we had parliament on Monday. So you yeah. had a tour of parliament, which you'd never had a tour of parliament no. before. Just share with us a little bit of your I, impressions. I loved it. I, I was saying to someone this morning, it really was one of the most memorable days of my life yesterday, because I love history and I love, you know, British history and all that. And, and I'd been around Parliament. I've certainly been in Westminster Abbey, et cetera. I'd never been inside the Parliament building and every room, not only are they stunningly beautiful rooms, but with so much historical resonance. So you walk into Westminster Hall and oh, that's where Thomas More, you know, was, was tried. And then you go next door to what was the chapel, but it's where the House of Commons met, like at the time of the American Revolution. And Edmund Burke would have, you know, been arguing his position in that room. And then you cross over and into the present House of Commons that had been destroyed during the Second World War and then rebuilt. And But Churchill would have been, you know, in this place. Then you go across and there's the House of Lords and there's the, the that gilded throne. And I mean, there's so so much resonance. And think, you know, speaking as an American, um, obviously we broke <laughs> from, from what do I say, England, Great Britain, the UK. We broke from you, you guys. But at the same time, we're, we're all, in, in a way, culturally uh, English. I mean, we're, we're so influenced by, you know, English history and so on. So to go into a place like the Parliament is um, very moving. I, I found it very moving. And then the chance to give the talk there to that marvelous audience last night. Um, including several MPs, huh? Uh, it just made it one of the most memorable days of my life. Yeah, it was a packed crowd. And I think there was at least 20 members and peers yeah. of all houses, um, you know, Catholic, Christian. And yeah. we took as a, as, a, as a theme for that. So Pope Benedict had given um, an, a historic address in, when he visited for the papal visit in 20, to September 2010. And the theme of the speech, really, there's a line in it. He said, um, religion isn't a problem for legislators to solve, but a vital contributor to yeah. the national conversation. It's an Quite excellent right. speech, well worth reading. And so we're kind of playing with those themes. What is it that you hope to, to say to them? Or what, did, what, did, what are you trying to say when, in that speech? I think just to remind everybody of how Christianity is so deeply ingrained in our culture uh, that we've been shaped willy-nilly by it. I, I mean, whether we know it or not, it's it's in the the cultural DNA of, of anyone who's been influenced by Christianity. I closed the speech, and I was very happy. I think he was a, a peer, you say, right, from the House of Lords. It was an older gentleman. And I had made reference to the Union Jack. And I said, which, as I look out over the Houses of Parliament, hovering over the whole thing is the Union Jack, which is three crosses kind of interposed on each other, Right. I said, how odd when you think about it, that central to this national symbol is the instrument of torture 
on which a young Jewish rabbi is, is put to death around the year 30 AD. That's the image, that's the symbol that we have and how deeply strange that is. And it speaks to the, to the distinctiveness, the uniqueness, the wonder, the, the odd um, quality of Christianity that holds God became one of us, died for us, was raised from the dead, that that reality is, is in the flag, which hovers over the whole of the, of the British uh, establishment, you know? And I remember he said to me, uh, I, I've been in this house, you know, for 40 some years, and I've, I've never thought of the Union Jack that way. And I thought, okay, that's the point I wanted to make. That, that's, that's what I wanted to convey. And that's the job of a great preacher, isn't it? Because there's so much within a church, but it's a kind of, they lack potency if they if if a preacher can't bring them to life to say to say what is in you know what is the fact it's almost kind of just preaching reality as it as it ought to be seen in a sense so yeah the kind of yeah the, the, that kind of prophetic role of preaching what well, I mean, you know I, I was very happy to be able to begin the speech with with Gandhi um and I mentioned sometimes it takes the, the outsider to look at a text with, with really fresh eyes that Christians have been reading Matthew 5, 6, and 7, you know, for centuries and centuries. And turn the other cheek and resist not evil and love your enemy, etc. And it become, oh, maybe kind of a banal abstraction for a lot of Christians. But Gandhi, reading it for the first time, it took his breath away. And he realized, this is fresh. This is new. This is something that could actually work. And then by God, he proved that it, it could work. And then he was imitated by some of the key players in the 20th century, from King to Tutu to John Paul II. And, and what I, I argued last night was, that's the dynamite of the church. That's the power of the church. And Gandhi, the outsider, saw it. But he helped Christians to realize, oh yeah, that's, that is at the heart of our great message. And then I tied it to the doctrine of creation and God making the world through a nonviolent act tied it to the ethic of the sermon, and then finally to the Paschal mystery, the dying and rising of Jesus. And I just, I guess I, I wanted to do in a way what, what Gandhi did for his uh, Christian uh, audience. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it that way, or I, I'm seeing it with a fresh uh, perspective. That was my goal last night. And it's, that's, that's revealing of, of blind spots. I think one of the things, there's a, there's a concept called the curse of knowledge. So it's like the longer yeah. that you've participated or yeah. studied in something, the harder it is to remember what it was like before. Yes. And, you know, how much of evangelization is impeded because, you know, we don't realize what we don't know. These blind spots exist. Um, so, yeah, that kind of sense of the, the curse of knowledge. How do we help people? <laughs> how do we help evangelists actually to get over the curse of knowledge? I mean, how awful that Christianity has become for many Christians a kind of tired, oh yeah, tired old Christianity. Oh yeah, that's uh, Christianity. Where Christianity is, if, when you get it, it's always fresh and always strange and always uh, unnerving and, and it compels you to see in a completely different way. Um, Paul saying, I know one thing, Christ and him crucified it. What? That, that would have struck them as the oddest possible thing to be, to be proclaiming. You're proclaiming someone who was crucified? You know, and then so to get that, what's at stake there? Uh, why he could say it with such blithe confidence? It's only in light of the resurrection. And Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, we say, oh yeah, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a nice, you know, pious, spiritual sentiment. That was, a, that was a bomb going off in the ancient world when Caesar was the Lord. And these, these first Christians with no army behind them, and no institutional support whatsoever, were blithely saying, no, Jesus is Lord. That's why they all ended up in prison, or, or most of them ended up killed, because the powers that, that be knew exactly what they meant. Well, well the fact that we've lost that, that, that we would never hear a phrase like, Jesus is Lord, and say, oh, yeah, ho-hum. That we wouldn't hear that and say, well, that's, that's a revolution. That's an explosion. Um, so that, that's part of what I want to recover is that very um, liberating oddness of, of Christianity. Mm. And I think that kind of links in with, a, um, in a sense, 
odd figure to, to English people, um, if you're not Catholic, this kind of figure of Thomas More. Mm. It's a big, it's a big theme of the of your of your week here. I think yeah. um, I hadn't watched A Man for All Seasons until mm. <laughs> until you'd spoken about. It. I think you're saying it was your favourite film. Yeah, you kind of watch it periodically. So, what does Thomas More mean to you? And we're going, of course, to visit his cell in the Tower of London this week. We're going to have a, a reception at um, the Great Hall, Lincoln's Inn, where, as a young lawyer, he was received to the bar mm. in the 15th century. So what does Thomas More mean to you? It means a lot to me. And, and it began with the movie. So I would have seen A Man for All Seasons when I was 16, probably for the first time. Maybe a high school teacher of ours showed it to us. I forgot. But uh, I've watched it, no kidding, every single year of my life since then. When I was a, a professor at the seminary, uh, I would always have a little evening on his feast day. I'd invite, my, it was during the summer, so the fellow faculty members come to my room and, and watch Man for All Seasons. I always showed it to my students during the school year. And, um, you know, Paul Schofield, the great Shakespearean actor, plays more in such a memorable way. So in my imagination, I, of course, I know the great Holbein portrait. I know what the historical Thomas More looked like. But I always think of Paul Schofield. I, mean, I always think of the figure from that play. And I, I could probably recite most of that play by, by memory, by heart. And uh, it had a huge impact on my own thinking and my own prioritization of values. Uh, it's a prime example of a saint teaching Christianity more than the theologians do, even as I reverence theology, but a saint teaches you what it's about. And that image of Schofield playing more uh, still, I mean, sings to me. Um, so that's, that's how more came to mean a lot to me. And um, one of the elements of this week that I'm really looking forward to is uh, we're doing a conference on the theme of sharing the church's, yeah. church's story. And I think in many ways it's it's a significant moment in, in England um, for the UK because since the pandemic, I would say it's probably going to be one of the largest gathering yeah, of Catholics in, in the UK. So we're so grateful to have you there. But I think your, your, your address, you're going to speak about the role of the laity in evangelization. Yeah. So what is it you, you, you're, you're going to say? Well, maybe just stay with Moore for a second because right, he's a great layman. You know, he's not a priest. Uh, he thought he might want to be a priest as a young man, and he always had an intense spirituality. But precisely as a layman, precisely as someone in the world, so more as a lawyer and then as a politician, then as a statesman at the highest level, becomes Lord Chancellor of England, so the highest appointed position in the realm. Um, a literary figure of great significance. I mean, known throughout Europe, Utopia and other works. Um, he's a model of Christian humanism. You know, that there's something beautiful about the, the monastic or Carthusian life and all that, but, but more exhibits the, the lay style, to use Balsar's language, the lay style of being a Christian in the world. And that's super important now. And see, look at Vatican II, the universal call to holiness. The call of the laity is now to sanctify the seculum, the, the secular order. So the order of politics and law and science and, and entertainment and business, finance, that's, the, that's not my job as a priest or a bishop. That's the laity's world. Now go forth and Christify it. Was well, he more knew that in the 16th century? I, I mean, more understood that in his bones. And then, then the other side of it, he lived that life as richly as it could be lived, but he knew, okay, push has now come to shove because I cannot stay in this position um, and be true to my conscience because of what you know Henry VIII is doing, because of the moves Henry VIII was making. More knew I can't with integrity continue. And then he, you know, resigned from that life and then paid the ultimate price for that integrity. Um, so he's in both those ways, such a model of, of a lay commitment to, uh, to the world. One of our, our great patrons um, for Catholic Voices is um, John Henry Newman. Yeah. And, uh, just seeing the kind of links there between, you know, kind of conscience and, you know, when he converted in 1845 and stuff, I think his sister never spoke to him again, that sense of, yeah, there's a real e English theme. I mean... What do you, what's your sense in, in the UK for Catholics, you know, having to make those kind of conscientious decisions? How can figures like Newman and Moore help lay Catholics as, you know, they kind of feel at the coal face. That's what prevents us from doing evangelization, right? It's the sense of the fear of what's going to happen with this. What would your advice be to Catholics to encourage them? Yeah, because you're right. Newman didn't pay the ultimate price the way Moore did, but he paid a price by God. I mean, he paid a huge price by becoming a Catholic. I mean, he had... He lost the world that, that he moved in so comfortably. You know, think of Newman prior to 1845 
is a major player, you know, in the establishment life here in, in England. And then he had to give most of that up. Uh, he recovered it by the end of his life in a way, you know, after the Apologia Pro Vita Sua, and he becomes sort of a revered elder figure. But he did sacrifice a lot to be a Catholic. Um, I find whenever I come here to England, it always strikes me how alive the 16th century is. Um, whenever I move in Catholic circles here, we're never far from Tyburn. We're never far from the great sacrifice of the martyrs. It's still very much a lively, you know, proposal in people's minds. Um, okay, that's, in a, in a way, that's a gift of grace, isn't it? Because from those figures, you take courage, seems to me. Uh, that you can and should be Catholic despite any opposition. We're not facing what uh, Edmund Campion faced. We are facing opposition, you know, from a secular culture. So polite persecution. <laughs> yeah, but it, but it is a real persecution. You know, the, the secular world is often uh, hostile to us, stands athwart our purposes. We face, you know, ridicule sometimes and, and uh, uh, contempt. Okay, well, heck, we can handle that. If, if Thomas More could face the chopping block and Edmund Campion could face, you know, Tyburn uh, tree, we can certainly face a little, <laughs> you know, public opposition. So maybe, especially here, to take courage from these great figures. So thank you so much, Bishop Barron, for, for joining us. And I want to give the last word uh, to Newman, in a sense, because I think it's quite central to both the missions of Catholic Voices and Word on Fire is this sense of uh, emancipated um, laity. You know, Newman in the 19th century was saying, I want an educated, well-instructed laity. I wish to enlarge their knowledge, to cultivate their reason, to get an insight into the relation of truth to truth, to learn to view things as they are. What are the bases and principles of Catholicism? And 150 years later, I still think in many ways we're trying to live up to that, that vision and of course, I think, the, you know, I'm grateful in the way that Catholic Voices helped me to do that. And Word and Fire has really inspired me, inspired millions around the world to do that. So just so grateful to you, Bishop Barron, for joining us today, for being in London for this week. My and pleasure. all the fruits that it will have. And, and thank you all for watching. Uh, God bless.